Welcome back to our series on Jeremiah and the Faithful Remnant, Surviving the Last Days. And this series is being sponsored by the Christadelphian Video Service. And we hope that you've been following us. And this is the 15th study, which is the concluding study of the series. So we're going to talk about the comfort for the man of contentions. And, and again, we pick up with Jeremiah that he was a man that went through great sufferings. In fact, as we pointed out in Hebrews chapter 11, where Paul talks about the prophets, um, there's one verse entirely dedicated to Jeremiah, cruel mockings, scourgings, bonds, and imprisonment. And he went through terrible sufferings in being put into the stocks, in being beaten uh, and, and scourged, uh, put into a terrible pit that was to be a death sentence, and then many years of imprisonment as well. And, and I think it's particularly important that God mentions Jeremiah in that verse in Hebrews chapter 11. And it was a 40-year ministry where he was, for most of that, he was uh, afflicted by enemies, opposed by false prophets and persecuted by evil kings. The mockings is something that Jeremiah constantly complained about. And any one of us knows that when we're even criticized or even someone makes a sarcastic remark, how hurt we can be. You can imagine if you are the prophet of God and you can't diminish what you have to say, and then people mock you and throw your words back in your face and taunt you with the things that you've had to deliver, how cruel and how hard that would be to, to take. And Jeremiah often complained to God about the way he was mocked. He had to be against the kings of Judah, against false prophets, against the people, against the priests, against the war cabinet. He had to oppose everybody, and he was very much alone in doing that. They had a few faithful friends to help him, but generally in the public rebuking of people, he had to do it on his own. And he suffered many things for that. But it was a terribly hard job to do that. And of course, he went through some amazing and punishments and became, as he called himself, the man of contentions. And that's how he said to God, I'm a man of contentions to the whole earth, always arguing and debating with people about what God has said. Well, he wrote all these words out. Barak the scribe wrote down his words. And then he was later put into the horrible pit where he had to be rescued by Ibn Melik and the others um, from that death sentence that he received. So he went through some terribly traumatic things. What is remarkable about Jeremiah is that he said, perhaps after Joseph, the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ, only second to Joseph. Think about some of these things connecting Jeremiah and Christ. They were both predicted and ordained before their birth. They were both rejected and persecuted by their hometown. They were rejected by their own family. They were alone and with no wife or family to support. They were accused of insanity, treason and blasphemy. All of those were the same with Jeremiah as they were with Christ. They had close supporters killed by evil kings. Of course, Jesus lost John the Baptist and Jeremiah lost Uriah the prophet. They were betrayed by close friends and by others. They were subjected to murderous plots by evil priests and rulers. They were both prophesying the destruction of the temple and the city. They both were weeping over Jerusalem's fate. They were both beaten, scourged and publicly humiliated. They were both sentenced to an unjust and cruel death. They were both failed by a weak ruler who could have saved them. They were both condemned to suffer a horrible death and they were raised from the pit. Isn't that interesting how much you can type? And that's just a few of the parallels you can draw between Jeremiah and Christ. And as I said, probably second only to Joseph in the types of the Bible. Well, let's come now to the book of Lamentations, because the book of Lamentations is something that Jeremiah wrote upon the fall of the city. What happened was the Babylonians began the siege in the ninth year and the tenth month, and it lasted until the 11th year. And eventually the city fell and there was great destruction. There had been a lot of loss of life through starvation and disease inside the seed city. Um, but there was, of course, a lot of destruction by the sword and by fire when the city finally fell. And Jeremiah was taken away unexpectedly by the Babylonians. I want to just do some reconciling of the record. If you just come back to Jeremiah and come to chapter 39, we read about Jeremiah being given opportunity to stay in the city or to go to Babylon. But when you read this, you need to actually connect it with chapter 40 because 
the, the whole story is not in one place. So in Jeremiah 39 and verse 11, now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar Aden, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look well to him, do him no harm, give him what he wants, whatever he says to you, do it. Um, and and so they were under orders from Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why would, the, why would the king of Babylon give orders concerning Jeremiah? Well, he may have read Jeremiah's letter that was sent in Jeremiah 29. More than likely, though, this was the influence of Daniel. But Daniel, being close to the king, was able to say the prophet Jeremiah has been there for 40 years. He's a great man. He's told them all along to surrender. He's been punished for it. Look after him, because he's now an old man. So there were specific orders to the princes, to the, to the, to the generals of, of the Babylonian army, to look after Jeremiah. Now, verse 14 says, They took him out of the court of the prison, committed him to get a liar, the son of Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home, and he dwelt among the people. Now, that is a summary that leaves out some important other events. Yes, it's true in the end. He left the court of the prison. He came back to Jerusalem being carried by Ahikim. But why did he have to carry him back to Jerusalem? Well, the answer is in chapter 40, because there was a, an imminent disaster for the generals of Babylon. So picking it up now in chapter 40, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, after that Nebuchadnezzar and captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah, what he taken him, being bound in chains among all that were taken from Jerusalem and Judah and, and were being carried away captive to Babylon. So what that's telling us is that when the city actually fell, all the prisoners that were in the court of the prison, like Jeremiah, were rounded up by the, by the, by the army of Babylon and they were marched north towards Ramah, towards um, Ribla, where Nebuchadnezzar was waiting for them, and there's this desperate struggle to find Jeremiah. You know, they've got specific orders, and they can't find him. And you get the impression that they were frantic trying to find this because the king had said Jeremiah must be found and saved, and and he's not there. They can't find him. Well, they find him at Ramah, and that's quite a, a day's walk from Jerusalem for an old man like Jeremiah. And when they get there, he's bound in chains. <laughs> you know, you can imagine how the, the Babylonian generals were feeling by this stage. You know, they, they could still almost feel the noose around their neck. And, and so what happens is, we come down to verse 4, and this is the captain of the guard talking to Jeremiah. Behold, I loose thee from the chains which were upon thy hand. It's almost apologetic, isn't it? If it seemed good to you to come with Babylon, then come, and I'll look after you. I bet he will. But see, me wanted thee to come, to come to thee in Babylon, forbear. But you can do what you like. The whole land is yours. You can take. You can go wherever you want. Wherever you want to go, you can go. And isn't it amazing? You know that that the Babylonians were so intent on giving Jeremiah the freedom to do whatever he wanted to do under the orders of Nebuchadnezzar, and you get the impression of how apologetic these generals were that they'd actually put him in chains, and. You know, they would just say, look, whatever you want to do. And then in verse 5, he starts on his way back. And in the end, he probably collapsed because he was over 60 by this stage. He's been in prison for years. He's been starved in the prison. He's been beaten. He's, he's been through all kinds of terrible trials. And, and he said, go back to get Eliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, because the king has appointed him governor over the land. And he'll look after you. And here's food to go with you. And he went to Gedaliah, and he dwelt back in Jerusalem amongst the people, at, and particularly at Mizpah, because the city was full of disease at that particular time. And isn't it fascinating that the Babylonians gave him food to send back and to go back to Gedaliah? But when you put the records together, Gedaliah came up to Ramah, picked up the emaciated, broken Jeremiah, and carried him home, which I think is the most beautiful phrase. He carried him home. And you can imagine, get Elias so carefully look after Jeremiah and nursing him back to health. What a, what a wonderful thing that was, that that should happen. But, you know, that was all in the plan of God. He preserved Jeremiah through the work of probably Daniel working on Nebuchadnezzar and working on the generals, and he was preserved to live another day. But then he went back to Jerusalem and sat amidst the ruins and wrote his lamentations. So probably somewhat regaining his health, he writes this amazing book, and this is 
one of the few books in the Bible beside the Psalms where there is a chapter structure. Almost every other book of the Bible, the chapters are being put in by the translators uh, only for convenience sake, and they're often in the wrong place. And we must learn to read through them because often you miss a theme or you miss a connection by reading just chapter at a time. So here is a very unusual book. It's an acrostic structure based on the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Very similar, of course, to the acrostic structure you find in Psalm 119, which goes through those 22 letters and has a number of verses for each letter. But chapter 1, 2, 4, and 5 have 22 verses, and chapter 3 has 66 verses, making thus seven chapters of 22, um, which again is, is, is a come of interesting numbers. Chapters 1, 2, and 4, every verse uses a letter of the alphabet in their alphabetical order. So again, very specifically, like this has been deliberately written in such a way to, to be an acrostic psalm. Of course, that aids memory when you're coming to try and memorize this book of Lamentations. Chapter 3, there's 66 verses, and, and three verses start with each letter, and again, in the order of the alphabet. And then you get to chapter 5. It's got 22 verses, but it's not strictly acrostic. They're not in the order of the Hebrew alphabet. And you can think about that and perhaps try to work out why. But you know, this book of Lamentations was written in such a way that it made people think about what God had done, and it was written for memorizing. And that's why it's acrostic, so it follows the alphabet uh, in the way that it was written. We can look at it, knowing the whole story of what Jeremiah had been through, knowing what the city was now looking like with the destruction and the burning that had taken place and the disease and the bodies everywhere. We can imagine what it was like for Jeremiah to come back to that city and to sit there and to see the people going, scrabbling through the ruins, trying to find something to eat, trying to rescue belongings, and no one really understanding that the immense tragedy, what this actually meant for the people of God. And, and Jeremiah writes this in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. You can imagine him sitting there, can't you, as all the people are mourning the loss of their loved ones, looking for supplies, trying to find amidst the, the broken building something to use for wood. He says this, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith Yahweh hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. From above he sent a fire to my bones. That was chapter 15. Thy word was a fire into my bones. I couldn't stop talking. It prevailed against them. It spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He made me desolate and faint all the day. And he's in a, in a, in a, a mental breakdown, if you, like, a, a, if you like, a breakdown of his resolution. He's going through a tremendous time of, of depression. And nobody else seems to understand the tragedy he's been through. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? And then I want you to notice the next words. If there be any sorrow, like unto my sorrow. Think we have heard those words before. Would they have been picked up? by the Reverend Jenkins, who put the words to the music that Handel wrote for Handel's Messiah. And they were picked up by that Reverend Jenkins and applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe it was exactly right. Because, you see, it comes after ye that pass by. Now, we haven't got time to go there now, but if you go to Luke chapter 15, you're going to see that when Jesus was carrying his cross, his head wreathed in a crown of thorns, blood pouring down his face, sweat pouring out of his body, carrying that cross and being weighed down under the weight of it. And it says, when he fell under the weight of that cross, that the Romans found a man that was just passing by. Isn't that interesting? And that man got to carry the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ to Golgotha, seeing in front of him the intense sorrow and grief of the Son of God and the suffering of the Son of God as they carried that cross together. He wasn't allowed to pass by. Now, I'll leave you to follow that thought through, which is an interesting one, but here is Jeremiah sitting in the ruins, and nobody understands what he's been through in the last 40 years.
Nobody understands the depth of the tragedy this means for the nation, that the people of God have now been taken away into captivity. And so he writes the book of Lamentations. Well, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, we have the opening of Lamentations, and we're not going to deal with the whole book. We couldn't possibly do that in this study. I want to just pick out the main features of this. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become a widow that was great amongst the nations and a princess among the provinces? How has she become tributary? Now this is that the nation of God, this is the kingdom of God he's talking about. Now a tributary nation desolated. She weeps sore in the night, her tears are on her cheeks. The lovers have, have none to comfort her. The friends have dealt treacherously with her, they have become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction, because of great servitude. She dwells amongst the heathen, she finds no rest. All the persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion did wrong, because none come to the solemn feast. Everything they had in that nation was now gone. And it goes on like this. You know, the, the, the tragic loss of the fact that they were the people of God, they were the nation of God, they were, the, they were to be a, an example to the rest of the earth, and now they are sitting in the ruins of their ruined city. And, and Jeremiah saw the tragedy it was for God and for the name of God that they should have been brought to this point by their own wickedness. So that's the, the style of Lamentations. But when we come to chapter 3, it gets very personal. In chapter 3, it starts off like this. And this, this chapter is so different to the other four chapters. It talk about the tragedy of the destruction of God's kingdom. This is about Jeremiah and what he went through mentally in his life, in the destruction of the city, and then coming to a resolution at the end of it. Now it starts off very badly. In the first 19 verses of, Jer of Lamentations chapter 3, we have a tremendous sense of injustice expressed by Jeremiah. And he's actually going through what we would call a mental crisis here, where he thinks about all the terrible things that's happened to him. And you can go through and you can put against all of these metaphors he uses, some of the terrible experiences he'd been subjected to. You know, the mocking, the cruelty, the beatings, the imprisonments, the, the solitary confinement, the pit. You know, and he, can, he says, God, none of this happened to me. And he's, he's actually making a lot of accusations that God has put him through a terrible experience. And he feels terribly, a, a great injustice has happened to him and, and a great personal cost has been served upon him. And so you can read these words on Lamentations. I'm the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He's led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. You can imagine that refers to the pit, where he's there in total darkness for 24 hours or more. He's turned his hand against me. My flesh and skin hath he made old. What did he look like when he came out of that pit? You know, you stay in the bath too long, your, your flesh goes white and crinkled. You imagine being in, in mire for 24 hours. He's broken my bones, which is a metaphor for suffering. He's built it against me. He's compassing with gall and travail. There's the mocking. He set me in dark places as though they'd be dead of old. It's like being in the grave. And he goes through 19 verses of this sort of misery and, 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 and complaint against God. I was a derision to all my people. This song all the day. There's the mocking and the derision he suffered. He's filled me with bitterness. He's made me drink wormwood. He's broken my teeth with gravel stones. There's nothing worse than when you've got a mouthful of, of, of gravel and, and broken teeth. He's covered with ashes. I've got no peace. I forget prosperity. My hope is perished. My affliction and my misery, the worm and the gall. He says, I can't get over these things. I have them still in remembrance and, and, and my soul is humbled in me. And, and this is the transition point that he goes through. You know, he goes through all this, this, this battle with the injustice of what he's had to suffer. But there's a conquering of his depressive thoughts when you come down to verse 19 to 21. And there's, there's a change in the tone. Now, we know that because when you go through the, the early verses down to verse 19 of Lamentations chapter 3, and let's just go there. I want to just point out the number of times that it's actually built around me and my because one of the signs of depression, as we saw from Barak's depression, is a self-centeredness, a self-pitying, a victim mentality. 
And when you go through this, I think it's about 35 times between verse 1 and verse 19 that you have the words I, me, and my in Jeremiah's complaint. So there's a tremendous self-centeredness in the complaint that he makes against God in those early 19 verses. And he's actually saying, these are the feelings I've had in the past, that I've had now, and the city has fallen. These are the things which I, I really struggle with. And he's, he's telling God what he's been thinking until he gets down to verse 20. My soul hath them stood in remembrance, is humbled in me. And you know that humility, when he starts to think, that, that what, a, what terrible things to think about my God. And so he says, when I recall to mind, when I, when I go back over them, I actually do have hope. And, and, and this is the transition point in his life where he, he begins to go from his, his depression and his misery and his, his sense of injustice, and he starts to realize that God is doing wonderful things. Now, I'm going to put up a few thoughts on Lamentations 3 for you. In verse 1 to 20, the depressive, resentful words are there. There's, there are over 30, I think it's 35, I, me, and my words in, the, in this complaint, which is a self-focus. And so many verses complain about his unfair treatment that he feels he suffered. Verse 21 is that transition. When I think about this, says Jeremiah, when I think about the way that I've blamed God, when I think about God's treated me unfairly, I'm ashamed of that. You know, I'm humbled about I'm humbled. I'm ashamed of it. Um, you know, in, in, in the margin of the AV, it's gone, I'm bowed down by it. So he actually starts to, to, to think, I shouldn't think like this. And then he starts to go back to hope. And so by the end of verse 21, when I thought about how bad I have been thinking, I actually have made a transition to hope. I'm ashamed of my dark thoughts. So from verse 22 to 36, he reconfirms his trust and confidence in God. In verse 37 to 51, he reflects upon the fact that God's punishments are just and what Judah suffered is what they thoroughly deserved. And then in verse 52, 52 to 66, he relives his trauma in the horrible pit. And I'll come back to that specifically later on because that was the, the most shocking experience of his life and it left him what we would call post-traumatic stress. And, and you can see that coming out at the end of this chapter. But we want to just trace through the transition that he goes through and, and how he re gets himself back to hope and to positive thinking about what God is doing in his life. Now, this is a translation of verse 17 to 20 from the Tanakh. Now, the Tanakh is the Jewish, the modern Jewish translation of the Bible. And I think you'll find it very useful. If you get hold of a copy of the Tanakh, it's a, a very good translation in many ways. But it actually brings out some of the Hebrew expressions using better words than the AV translators gave us. So this is verse 17 to 20, reading from um, verse, verse 18 to 20. My life was bereft, bereft of peace. I forgot what happiness was. It had perished before Yahweh. To recall my distress and my misery was wormwood or poison. So when I started thinking like that, I realized this was bitterness that I shouldn't have. Whenever I thought of them, I was bowed low. But this I call to mind. So he's now going back to hope. I recall to mind that I've been thinking the wrong way and I've now got to think the right way. And here's what he comes to. Well, he says in verse 22, it is of Yahweh's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So in number one, he starts to remember the promise he was given that they would be delivered. You know, God says, I'll give you a life for a prey and your friends a life for their prey. And they had been delivered from the Babylonian the slaughter that had taken place. They were not consumed in the taking of the city. Why? Because God keeps his promises, his compassions fail not. So you see, he recognizes that for all his bitterness, he had been saved, he'd been preserved. He goes on to say, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And the actual Hebrew, and it's picked up by the Tanakh, the Hebrew for that there is something I want to come back to. But it actually means ample is your grace. And that's how the Tanakh puts it. God's grace is utterly abundant. So 
he's not just saying that that you know God keeps his promises. What he says is God is absolutely wonderful and abundant in his grace. And that is a much better translation of verse 23. He goes on to say, Yahweh is my portion, saith my soul, there will I hope in him. And, and the theme of hope comes out again in chapter 3. It's in verse 21, it's in verse 24, it's in verse 26, it's in verse 29. And, and you get this idea that there is hope being delivered to the people of God when they get their thinking straight. And Jeremiah is now reprogramming his thinking about God. Instead of complaining about and being bitter about what's happened to him, he now says, I realize that God's been working a much greater work than I appreciated at the time. So now I've got my hope back. Yahweh is good to them that wait for him, for the soul that seeketh him. So again, here's Jeremiah coming to resolution that you have to wait for God in his own good time to bless you. So going back to the Tanakh, this is the same verses from that Jewish Bible. Therefore I have hope. The kindness of Yahweh has not ended. You see that idea of grace coming through there? His mercies are not spent. They are renewed every morning. Ample is your grace. And that's, that's the, the much better translation of the Hebrew. Yahweh is my portion, I will say with a full heart. Therefore will I hope in him. Yahweh is good to those who trust in him. So again, this, this, this wonderful expression of his return to confidence from depression, that God is at work, God's ways might be different to ours, that God puts us through things, but his grace is ample for us. He will give us his grace, even in troublous times. You know, this, this concept of ample is your grace comes up, I think, quoted by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he pleaded with God to take away his illness that afflicted him and prevented him from working as he would like to do. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now that's almost, isn't it, ample is your grace. For my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, that's what Jeremiah had come to realize, that even though he had been on the, the rough end of the treatment by the kings and the prophets and the priests, even though he'd been scourged and beaten and imprisoned and sentenced to death, even though he was one man on his own, God's strength was made perfect in, his, in weakness because Jeremiah survived and the others didn't. They went to Babylon, they were killed, Jeremiah is alive. So, you know, Jeremiah was an example of what Paul had to learn himself concerning his own disabilities that he prayed to be taken away. Ample is your grace. And it's a wonderful thought that God's grace is incredibly sufficient for us. No matter what we're going through, no matter what circumstances come upon us in life, let's say with Jeremiah, ample is your grace. We only need God's protection, God's forgiveness, God's kindness to bring us to his kingdom. And that grace is ample, even though we might go through many sufferings in this life. And then Jeremiah makes a conclusion about his sufferings. He says this, It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. Remember James says, the patience of the prophets, the endurance of the prophets. And Jeremiah had to learn that, that he must now wait for the salvation of Yahweh. God wouldn't save that generation. He wouldn't save his temple. He wouldn't save the city. When they went down to Egypt, they disobeyed the word of God through Jeremiah by going to Egypt. Down there, again, Jeremiah condemned them and they wouldn't listen to him. In the end, God sent Nebuchadnezzar into Egypt in BC 582 and wiped out the Jewish remnant in Egypt, by which time we believe Jeremiah had probably died of old age. But you see, he learned to hope and to quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. And that's what we have to learn to do in our lives, as we wait for the coming of Christ and the kingdom of God, whatever happens, whatever tribulations God allows to come our way, God is working in us to improve us to be fit for his kingdom. We have to hope and quietly wait for the salvation of God. And remember, ample is God's grace. Well, in verse 27, it is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. He'd started at the age of 20, and now he's over 60. 
and he now realized that it, his life experience, trouble it though it had been, nevertheless was a good course of life to undertake. In the rest of this chapter, he deals with the justice of God in condemning Judah, the fact that God puts people through tribulation for their own good, and then he encourages people in verse 40, let us search and try our ways, turn again to Yahweh, lift up our hearts with our whole hands of the God in heaven, we have transgressed, we have rebelled, but thou hast not pardoned. And he then makes the point that the fall of Judah was completely justified then we come to the, the section in verse, from verse 40 on 49 onwards down to verse 63, and where he just relives his trauma in that pit. And I can't emphasize enough how terrible it must have been when they put the stone upon that pit. He's 20 meters down, up to his neck in mud, water rushing in occasionally, and then gradually going away as he's choking and spluttering, and his flesh beginning to rot away. And you just see it there, don't you? And what he says that, you know, my enemies chase me like a bird without cause. They've cut off my life in the dungeon, cast me the stone upon me. Waters flowed over my head, and I said, I'm cut off. He thought he was going to die. I called upon thy name out of the low dungeon. You heard my voice. Cry not thine ear at my breathing, at my crying. Thou drawest near the day that I called upon thee and said, Fear not. Thou hast pleaded the cause of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. O Yahweh, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and their imaginations against me. You have heard the reproach, O Yahweh, and all the imaginations against me. The lips of those that rose up against me and their device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Can you imagine what those that the war cabinet we read about in, in Jeremiah 38, can you imagine what they said as they began to lower him into that pit, as they saw him there sink in the mire? And before they put the stone on, the, the horrible things they would have said to him about what they were expecting to happen to him down in that pit, how they would have thrown his words back in his face. And, you know, he says, remember them, O God, and recompense according to the work of their hands. And and you just get some idea of, of the tremendous post-traumatic stress that Jeremiah is going through, that, now in the ruins of Jerusalem, that horrible experience is coming back to haunt him. And he's just reliving it once again. And, you know, it's just good, isn't it, that he actually came to, to end up with, with having his hope and confidence in God restored to quietly now wait for the salvation of God as the old man that he was. So what do we take away from Jeremiah and the faithful remnant? Well, number one, his conclusion is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. It's something for all young people to think about. Committing ourselves to the things of God at an early age, to the people of God, to the service of the people of God at a young age is something we can all do, and it will bear its fruits. It is good to bear the yoke while we're young. Let's learn that lesson as young people. For all of us, be very willing to hear the word of God, like Josiah was. You know, He wept. He was greatly moved when he heard the words of God being read to him. Let us... Move us to action like I did for Josiah to preserve God's holiness. So be like Josiah. Be moved by the word into action. Don't be like the evil Jehoiakim who burnt the word of God. He would not hear it. And God said, that has been your philosophy from your youth that you will not hear. So he closed out the word of God. But let's not be like Zedekiah either. He wanted to hear the word of God but wouldn't do it. Both those kings were, were evil and were condemned as such. Think of Barak, think of Ebed Melech, think of Gedaliah. Be loyal friends. Think of Ahiakim rescuing Jeremiah when he was again under the sentence of death. You know, loyal friends mean a tremendous amount, and we need to be loyal friends to each other and, and help each other through times of accusation and distress and fear, and to stand up for our brethren because they under the law of Christ, can't really defend themselves. We need to go in there and say they are not worthy of death, they have not done these things, and to plead for them. And be loyal friends in times of accusation and fear. When it comes to repeating the word of God, we, we cannot diminish a word. There is a great temptation to water it down, to make it acceptable to the current work generation. 
We have to stand for the purity of God's ways against all the worldly wisdom, against all the worldly values we're faced with today to say that this is how God says it. And though it might be unpopular and not even accepted by some Christadelphians, say what God has said and diminish not a word. And then to think about the remnant. You know, we can't save everybody in the world. We can't save the vast majority of the world. They don't want to listen. And even inside the ecclesia, there are those who want to drift away and we can't stop them. But we have to work with the remnant that God has given us. There are those that we can influence. And God took the remnant from Jeremiah that he'd been educating for that 40 years and he sent them across into the care and the comfort of Ezekiel that they might prepare the way for the exiles to return. And God's lesson to Ezekiel and to Jeremiah was, look after the remnant that I have given you. And we must do that and try and work with those that want to listen to the words of God. We're taken from Lamentations chapter 3. No matter what we suffer, no matter what God allows us to go through, no matter what persecution or sadness or depression standing for the word of God brings, let us patiently wait in hope for the salvation of our God. And until our Lord comes, strengthen the remnant, strengthen the things that remain. Thank you for your attention to this series.